discussion. Honorable Chairperson, on the 16th of June, we will be in Mangaung for the Youth Month Honorable commemoration under the theme Accelerating Youth Economic Emancipation June, we will for a Sustainable Mangaung Growth. For the youth month. We will deliver a more detailed report the on the work that we are doing in addressing the challenges facing the youth growth. of our country. For the youth month. We will in line with the commitment I made in this August House during the oral reply session of 20th April 2023, I led a two-day outreach program together with the Human Resource Development Council in KwaZulu Natal Province on the 18th and 19th of May 2023, the focus of this multi stakeholder council was to visit the province and assess the impact of the human resource development strategy in the province and strengthen its alignment with the implementation of the district development model in Etegwini and Umkungundo municipalities. During the human resource development council, of meeting meeting development model of 19th of May in KwaZulu Natal, members of the Council recommitted themselves during the human to skills development objectives by signing two social compacts. One focused on building the foundations for learning, led by the National Education Collaboration Trust, and the second one focused on building skills for transformation in the economy and society led by the National Skills Authority. We also visited projects that support skills development, particularly for young people and job creation in the province. Specifically, we visited the following, the Western Precinct, which is located in the Etegwini municipality, and the, the Shongweni, the Shongweni Economic Development Node, Located in the is the, the uh, in the initial phase of the construction of the new smart the city the uh, between Deben and Peter Maritzburg. Is the and second, is the it is a collaboration the between the city, the private sector, city, Mangange. It contributes to what increasing the skills level for young people, also for women with disabilities, and also military. The, the, the precinct uh, opened an on-site technical training center in April of this year. And also which equips people from Shongweni and the surrounding communities with the critical skills required training to participate meaningfully in the construction phase from and, and beyond. It is anticipated that almost 500 community members will be equipped with these trade skills at the end of the current phase of this development in November of this year. The second was the Sidera College of Agriculture. The Sidera College of Agriculture, which is located in Hilton, in Umgungundrovu District Municipality, is the second oldest agriculture college in the country. The college support the farming community through services such as soil analytics and contribute to food security and employment opportunities. At this college, we also interacted with over 80 young people and emerging farmers from Kokstad, Amazimtoti, Mwai River, and beyond. Mongungundlovu Tivet College and Education Precinct. This precinct has almost 40 partnerships with government departments, with municipalities, or also non-governmental organization and the private sector companies, all of which converge to the government has allocated 182 million rands for this pressing project. And this model will be replicated across the country. We are convinced that the engagements we have held together with the Human Resource Development Council 
are yielding the required results. We are going to continue with this work, especially strengthening the collaboration between the government and the private sector in order to create the much needed jobs. This is the district development model in action. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. Uh, we'll now move on to the first supplementary question from Honorable Mwai. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. And I must say that we really appreciate the manner in which the Deputy President of the Republic has discharged his responsibilities since uh, appointed uh, to this important position in the country by engaging earnestly with various stakeholders in our communities with view of finding answers to complex challenges that continue to face our country. And I want to say that also it is clear that we need to do more decisive interventions uh, and encourage more black communities to change their mindset of how they view vocational education, especially given our need for more technical and artisan skills. And this we should do without fail, given uh, the history of apartheid colonialism in our country, where many of our people were discouraged in order to even protect uh, the white workers at that period. Now, I would like to ask the deputy president, what are the plans of government of increasing the human development programs and capacity for skills of the changing world to equip young people with skills for the, uh, like uh, digital economy, technological innovation, and, and even to like uh, the green economy. Thank you, Chair. Deputy President. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> uh, Chairperson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Mohai. Through the work of the Human Resource Development Council, uh, one of the things we are doing is to ensure that we equip young people with skills, especially uh, in the field of science and technology. Uh, so that's what we've been working hard on, particularly because of our uh, contribution to the fourth industrial revolution. And that's that we do through all levels of government. Uh, secondly, you'll recall that in his budget speech, the Minister of Higher Education also announced that 26 TVET colleges are currently engaged in entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial training for what is called entrepreneurial hubs. These are meant to assist young people, but also the Minister has also announced that they are looking at where, what they call youth not in education, employment or training. Uh, and also uh, support that. And one of the other initiatives is through the National Skills Fund. Uh, through the National Skills Fund, government allocates funding capacity for capacity building to community colleges. And there they introduce skills programs, learnerships, and non -form, uh, to also non-formal programs, specifically uh, targeting young people's so, Honorable Mbhai, I believe that these initiatives will assist a lot in order to, to strengthen uh, capacity for young people. We know that in the past, young people uh, you know, did not like TVET colleges. There was a kind of stigma against TVET colleges. But I think a lot has been done now to turn that around. And a lot of young people are now going uh, to TVET colleges to acquire the necessary skills that the economy wants. And that's what we are encouraging. Yes, thank you very much, uh, uh, Deputy President. We'll now proceed to the second follow, the second follow up question uh, from Honorable Poshoff. Thank you very much, Chairperson, and good afternoon, Deputy President. Deputy President, we know that there are severe staff shortages with respect to teachers as well as medical professionals, such as doctors and nurses. One of the main reasons we are told is because of budget shortages. 
So my question to you is what engagement have you had with Treasury as well as the Departments of Basic Education and Health to address their budget prioritization, to address these crucial shortages? As Deputy President, there is absolutely no point in tra training the youth in these crucial roles if there are no jobs for them once they have graduated. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Boshoff. Deputy uh, President. Thank you very much, uh, <laughs> Honorable Member. As I said, through the Human Resource Development Council, our focus is really on hardcore skills and to ensure that when young people have graduated, they are able to, to find uh, jobs. Uh, I haven't specifically met yet with uh, Treasury uh, to check what their challenges are in terms of, of uh, funding. But of course, uh, we would like to agree with you that we, it's important that when young people go through colleges uh, and universities as well, when they come out, uh, they should be employable. Uh, I will engage with, with National, National Treasury going forward. Uh, and ensure that we look at what uh, uh, the, the challenges are. But the good thing with the HRD, uh, DRC, the, the Human Resource Development Council, is that we also involve the private sector. So that way we are able to also bring resources outside of government. And, and I hope that is going to help going forward to ensure that uh, uh, we don't give up and say we don't have funding. Uh, so those those are some of the initiatives, Honourable Chairperson, that we we are looking at. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Uh, we'll proceed to the third uh, supplementary question from Honourable uh, Muletzani. Thank you, Chairperson. <clears throat> the ANC government has in the past stated that it is not its responsibility to create jobs for the millions of unemployed people of South Africa. As the EFF, we are therefore not surprised by the high youth unemployment rate, as this is a consequence of the ruling party's policies and ideologies. Nevertheless, how will the engagements which you refer to, Deputy President, benefit the thousands of young skilled graduates who are sitting at home right now. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Uh, Honorable Milatani, I think the, the first part of your comment is a misunderstanding of what the ANC said. Uh, the ANC didn't say it's not its job to create, it's not its job to create jobs. What the ANC said was that the creation of jobs or employment is largely the responsibilities of the private sector because that's where it happens. Uh, so the, our approach, even as government, is that we can come up with policies and funding, but it's important that we bring the private sector on board because government alone will not succeed. Uh, so, so that was really what we were saying that Let's not say as the government will create employment and do everything, we'll create employment in collaboration with others, particularly the private sector. So that's the point we are making. How will these programs assist young people is to equip, equip them with skills, but not only skills, also access to resources. When we were in KZN, some of the emerging farmers, for instance, uh, were saying we should help them with access to land, some of them markets. Uh, so it's not just skills, but access to resources that will assist them. So the, the Human Resource Development Council is a collaborative effort that work with the provincial, local government, communities. We are now bringing in the private sector, in rural areas, even traditional leaders. And I'm, I'm convinced that that's, this is the right approach that is going to help young people. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Shepherds. Thank you very much. Uh, we will proceed to the fourth supplementary question from Honorable Haddebe. 
Thank you, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Deputy President. <clears throat> South Africa's unemployment rate worsened in the first quarter of 2023, jumping by 0.2% from the fourth quarter of 2022 to 32.9%, with youth unemployment especially concerning. I would like to know whether your department or your office has completed a youth survey on skills shortages um, in all or across all nine provinces in order to focus intervention strategies in accordance with the gaps that were identified. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, my office has not particularly itself, when I say my office, I mean the presidency, has not itself uh, conducted surveys yet, but we we have uh, uh, divisions in the presidency that are particularly focusing on challenges that are facing young people. Um, you recall that some of the programs that the president announced are particularly focusing on young people. Uh, you can look at uh, the youth st uh, stimulus package, and a lot of other initiatives. Um, we will look into that matter, but we, we already know that the, the high levels of unemployment in South Africa affect mainly young people. So already we, we are aware of that, and therefore our interventions are going to be mainly focused on young people. We might want to dissect uh, that further to look at the various uh, uh, categories. Uh, so we are designing our programs in such a way that uh, we give uh, young people, most of them skills, and create opportunities uh, for them to, uh, to get uh, opportunities to be employable, but also to run their own businesses uh, and so on. Uh, I will follow up with my team to see if there's a need for us to do further surveys to look into, into that issue. But, uh, Definitely, we have to prioritize young people. Thank you very much, Chairperson. No, thank, you. thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. Honorable members, we'll now move on to question number eight. This question is on um, land reform and uh, uh, agricultural uh, uh, support. The question is from uh, Honorable Ogam and is, is, is directed, to, directed to the Deputy President. Uh, Deputy President. Honorable Chairperson, when we responded to a similar question on the 25th of May this year, we outlined a number of programs that government has put in place to address both financial and technical support to emerging farmers. This includes, amongst others, the Comprehensive Agricultural Support Program and Ili Malitsima which is aimed at resourcing and equipping producers towards increasing food production and other value chain uh, initiatives. Secondly, the Land Development Support Program, which support land reform by assisting farmers who acquired farms uh, with infrastructure, farm machinery, equipment, production development inputs, and also provision of uh, technical support and mentorship. Third, the blended finance scheme, which support commercialization. This, this, the, the fourth, the South African Good Agricultural Practices Certificate Program, which assists farmers to meet minimum food safe, safety and quality requirements and thus ease access to the markets. And lastly, collaboration with the Japan International Cooperation Agency and the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization for the implementation of the farmer field schools. Both this intervention enhanced the provision of extension services to small scale farmers mm -hmm. towards maintaining sustainable food production and market access. Honorable Chairperson, as part of the comprehensive farmer support, the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform, and Rural Development 
provides capacity development interventions that is focused on capacitating producers with skills requisites uh, and mentorship based on their needs at the farm level. In this regard, we will be implementing targeted programs to empower the most disadvantaged sectors of our communities, including the youth, women, and people living in disabilities. Some of the things that we will be doing is the following. <laughs> Through the presidential employment stimulus, we have been able to provide production inputs for the most vulnerable producers for household food security and self-employment. Two, farmer production support units provide a central service for producers to get production inputs, mechanization, and technical support. Third, the land core program is aimed at protecting and preserving natural resources and creating employment opportunities in rural communities. Fourth, the animal and felt management program pro provide animal husbandry related infrastructure such as fencing and handling, dipping facilities, etc. The River Valley Catalytive Program is designed to revitalize irrigation schemes, particularly in rural areas. The Macro Agricultural Finance Institute of South Africa provides affordable loans for producers. And the National Rural Youth Service Corps program targets unemployed uh, rural youth with skills capacity. Chairperson, as government, we are committed to fast track the pace of land reform in order to ensure the improvement of our people's lives for the better, especially those living in rural areas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Honorable Deputy President, land reform has failed due to a lack of urgency and corruption by the ANC government. This failure was confirmed by the high level panel led by former President Khalema Motlante. It's not me that said it, it's the high level panel under Khalema Motlante that said it. We have seen how this government from the ANC tries to hide its failures with land reform by introducing laws that will firstly not benefit land reform or food security, and secondly, will not pass the test of constitutionality. An example of this is government's latest ploy to implement race quotas on water users, knowing full well that these water users are farmers. These proposed water quotas will have the effect that a farmer that irrigates as little as 30 hectares of land will be subject to quotas in his farming business. Therefore, Honorable Deputy President, are these proposed water quotas just another feeble attempt by the ANC government to hide their inability to effect meaningful land reform and transformation as it was intended and needed? If not, what are your intentions? with these water quotas and what agricultural support will be achieved by these draconian and racist water quotas. Thank you, Chairperson. Honorable Deputy President. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairperson. Uh, I did indicate uh, <clears throat> the last time I spoke, I can't remember what it was in this house, that we have accepted ourselves as the governing party that uh, land reform has been slow. Uh, but I don't think we should give an impression that nothing has happened. If you look at uh, uh, the figures out there, I won't quote most of them, but for instance, a total of 552,000 households have benefited from land reform programs, with 174,000 being female-headed households, 1,240 households headed by people with disabilities. 700,000 hectares of state land has been identified and distributed uh, as early as uh, 2020. So there is a lot, honorable member, uh, that is happening, but you'll recall as well that as we involved 
get involved in, in land reform, redistribution and restitution, we are also doing transformation. Uh, so programs like the quotas you're talking about are intended to ensure that the previously disadvantaged are also brought into the mainstream of uh, the economy uh, through programs uh, that they will acquire through land redistribution and rest, uh, re, re, restitution. Uh, so there's a lot that government is doing in that regard to ensure that uh, uh, we correct uh, the, the problems of the past uh, and, and return land to our people and to ensure that they actually get involved in farming. And there's a lot of support that uh, government is going to do to fast track that, including Operation Pakisa, land development support programs, there's a number of programs that we have put in place and we want to support all farmers. Uh, we are not discriminating, uh, but it's important to redress the imbalances of the past. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now proceed to uh, supplementary question number two uh, from Honorable Bibi. Baba <laughs> Gago put in jay, or with the knees, no balegil, which I want to buy it, Abanam Shah. Like among a male, Segel among a male Baba Umbuzo, Wami Utilana, Ingabe, Ulumen, Angalegala Ganja, and if we sing with Sinjali, Ulabo Balino, or Bapella, by a tandem, Abu Uti Balime, then the coin can go for Neganja, but to bond. Inga Gumbe, oh, Mamma, Incha. Kanye nemphakathi yasemakhaya iyabonga seke lebonga mel baba Deputy President uh, thank you very much uh, honorable chairperson mama eh umbuzo wakho muhle kakhulu ngoba into evela siyenza Ogote batolum sab, I want to bag it. Jongo Bosho, Abaning Babo, Abana Umsa, good balim. Nyang Asho Kalenige, good Kunama program, Mrs. Zenga, good snet de Bona. Jenga Leben Kulman, I would a farmer support program. Yenze Lelionto. Le farmer support program, ya. Ya begwa u minister u titiza nsa kulumange budget yake u budget speech guti. Enye ntu azwe yenza guti gube ne land development support and na le ntu sibiza guti i blended finance facility as yenza ni ITC. I ma li lezo eze nze lo tzinete la baba funuglim. No ma abo mama Bantaba Kuba Zegile, Incha Lama program la Enzelebo na mebe mbaba zeba apply sizoba net Gwenze gang nesenis katolut abaz gutakona lama program. Ainze lug neta bot. So mas bachel get beze sisabenza foot in a land bank na yo yenzeloti snete bonke aba funum slaba naba funugli. Nyabo. Mama. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, the President. We'll proceed to Honorable Brain. Thank you, Chairperson. Deputy President, with reference to the accelerated land reform and agricultural support to qualifying individuals, what measures are in place to ensure that existing commercial farming activities on that form the basis of food security are not affected negatively in any way? Thank you. 
thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, Honorable De Bruyne, uh, we agree with you that we must try as much as possible not to uh, disturb programs that ensure food security. Uh, that's why commercial farmers are not our targets. Uh, but what we are saying is that when you go out there, you do find farmers with vast tracts of land. Uh, some they don't, uh, they are not even uh, uh, farming on or producing food. So we are saying there need to be a balance that you dis redistribute land to ensure more people to come into agriculture without chasing anybody away. So the, the commercial farmers that are there need to be supported. They are being supported. They have access to loans from, from the land bank. And we, we do want to see them producing more and more uh, to ensure food security in our country. But there's also that must go hand in hand in ensuring that we bring more people uh, into agriculture, uh, particularly from the disadvantaged communities. Uh, so we, we are finding a very good balance uh, in doing that. And in fact, we have, with the president in the past, met with a lot of commercial farmers. Uh, it was quite interesting because in one of the meetings that I attended, one of the commercial farmers uh, came to us as with the former deputy president. And this commercial farmer said to us, how can we help? Uh, we have learned. Uh, we have skills. You want to bring more people into agriculture? We are there to work with you. So let's work with commercial farmers in our country, not chase them away, uh, not disrupt their production, but bring more people uh, to increase pro productivity in the, in the farming sector. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh... Let's allow Honorable Hihi to occupy a seat as, as we call upon um, uh, Honorable Mkausi to raise the fourth supplementary question. Honorable Mkausi? Chaperson. Yeah. Thank you, Manbule Lengu, Honorable Tafen. Mkausi. Yeah, Chaperson. Deputy President, the recent report of the Department to the Land Claims Court on progress made in settling land restitution claims indicates that it may take a further 30 years to settle the less than 7,000 land claims lodged in 1998. The Department further indicates that it will need $68 billion to settle this claim have you engaged in the department to get the full details of why the settlement of these claims has been delayed? If so, what steps are you putting in place to fast track the settlement of these claims? Because most of those who lodge the claims are dying. I thank you, Deputy President. Thank you very much. We'll proceed to Deputy President. Thank, thank you very much, Honorable Member. Uh, obviously, it is in our interest to ensure that uh, uh, land claimants uh, do receive their land in their lifetime. But obviously, some of them are old, as you say, can't wait forever. Uh, one of the things that we are doing now with the President is to meet with all ministers to look at uh, their programs, what they are prioritizing, this is a, the matter that we have discussed with the Minister of Agriculture and, and Land Reform, and, and it's something that they are dealing with to fast track uh, these programs. Uh, you may recall that one of the challenges is sometimes because of disputes uh, from lame, land claimants uh, within families or sometimes even, even communities don't, who don't just agree uh, on the use of land on, or who belong to that uh, particular area. And those tend to delay uh, the program of land reform to ensure that uh, people get back their land. 
through redistribution or re restitution. But we are we are addressing that. I think it is in our interest to ensure that uh, 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 people do access land uh, as as quickly as is possible. Uh, so we are trying our best. Thank you very much, uh, Honourable Member, for the question. Thank you very much, Jefferson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. We will now proceed, Honourable Members, to question number nine. This question is a question on uh, service uh, delivery hotspots. The uh, question is from Honourable Bartlett and is directed uh, to the Deputy President. Uh, Deputy President. Chairperson, thank you uh, very much. Chairperson, government has identified service delivery hotspots with the aim to improve universal access to basic services such as clean water, sanitation, sustainable energy, refuse collection, and other essential services. An evaluation of the state of local government that was conducted last year revealed that the number of dysfunctional municipalities had increased from 64 to 66. Among other things, this increase can be attributed to lack of capacity, poor governance, financial management, corruption, as well as failed coalition governments. Honorable Chairperson, in this regard, the Department of Water and Sanitation, working together with the elected leadership in municipalities, have agreed on a number of improvement plans to, re re to resolve, amongst others, water-related challenges. Part of the solution includes the following interventions. One, financial support through the Regional Bulk Infrastructure Grant and Water Services Infrastructure Grant. Two, technical advice and management support from the Department of Water and Sanitation and its water boards. Similar interventions have been put in place to resolve the issue of water contamination in Hamanskral in the north of Tswani, where unfortunately lives were lost due to this crisis. President Sel Ramaphosa recently announced that the Department of Water and Sanitation Kokta, Houghton government, together with the city of Tswani, have begun collaborating on a larger scale to revamp and expand the Roy Val water treatment plant to resolve the water and sanitation challenges in Amanskra. This project is expected to take three years to complete at a cost of 4 billion rent. The Development Bank of Southern Africa has been brought on board to manage the project. In the meantime, government will keep on providing clean water to the people of Amaskra through water tanks, while Mahalis water build what they call package water system that will provide water to the people. Honorable Chairperson, through the district development model, we are ensuring that not only is the provision of essential services expanded, but also that communities outside of the service delivery hotspots do receive dependable and high, high quality services. We strongly believe that through the DDM and service delivery rapid response approach, we shall have in each district one plan that is measurable, implementable and citizen focused. Government will continue to implement measures to ensure that communities have access to dependable and high quality services, amongst others, the deployment of technical professionals, uh, the revival of the green drop and blue and blue drop certification by the Department of Water and Sanitation, the adoption of national pothole repair programs to intensify the fight against potholes and general road refurbishment and improvement. Honorable Chairperson, what is critical, what is of critical importance to us is that as we execute these reforms, we are putting communities at the heart of service delivery and organizing citizens and members of civil society to contribute towards the development of a brighter tomorrow for all. 
Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairs. Thank you very much, uh, President. We proceed to Honorable Malika, who replaces the uh, Honorable Bartlett. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, Deputy President, the delivery of quality and reliable services to communities is directly linked to the quality of the infrastructure, resources, and maintenance system of municipalities. Municipalities with poor infrastructure lack resources and have inadequate man maintenance plans, and those in failed and failing collision arrangements form the majority of municipalities that are located in service delivery hotspots. Uh, Deputy President, to what extent is government ensuring that infrastructure improvement, maintenance and protection of infrastructure, particularly from uh, vandalism form of uh, a key part of the acceleration of service delivery improvement drive, particularly in the service delivery hotspot? Thank you, Deputy Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Member. As government, we have put a number of initiatives uh, in place uh, to improve, particularly the maintenance of key infrastructure across the country. Uh, one of the programs that is in place is what we call the Municipal Infrastructure Support Agent, MISA. Uh, so through MISA, government has identified the gaps that exist uh, and also to look at uh, the inability of certain municipalities uh, to be able to deliver or manage infrastructure in a reliable manner or ensure that they are, there is a provision of basic quality uh, services. There's also the municipal infrastructure support agent uh, uh, that uh, is also strengthening our dis district development model, the DDM. Amongst others, some of the things, and uh, I'll conclude, Chairperson, because there's a lot that is happening there, is also the what uh, we are doing uh, to support uh, municipalities uh, through this infrastructure support agent, like conduct effective infrastructure planning, support and assist municipalities in the in implement implementation of infrastructure projects uh, to determine, as to determine what uh, municipalities should do in their IDPs, support and assist municipalities with operation and maintenance, and also build the capacity of, of municipalities. So there are a lot of initiatives that we are doing to ensure that we, we support these municipalities because we are aware of, of these challenges and we're going to continue to do so. Thank you very much, Shepherds. Thank, thank you, Ralph. Deputy President, we'll proceed to Honorable Hart -Ebe. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Deputy President. <clears throat> when it comes to the issues of service delivery, we know that uh, a one size fits all approach will not work. Mm -hmm. As contextually, the problems faced by provinces differ, considering that uh, in Etewin municipality, it would take the municipality more than 90 years to address the current informal settlement backlog, given the current fiscal allocations. I would like uh, to know how you will ensure that basic services, such as the removal of uh, garbage, and water and sanitation are provided to South Africans living in these areas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Khadebe. Um, yes, uh, the first uh, approach for us, as I said earlier, is to support municipalities, help them with capacity, uh, there have been instances where we see huge dysfunctionalities, uh, you know, almost leading to collapse of service delivery. There, there are interventions uh, where government can 
come in and put the municipality under administration to be able to then provide services either through a provincial government or or directly from national government but we avoid that as a first move uh, of course i understand your concern that there shouldn't be a gap where services are not provided so where we support we must see improvement if that is not happening uh, then we can come with section 139 take over uh, to be able to provide services we have done that in a number of areas you've seen in in places like uh, mfuleni at some point mohali city and, and now in the free state uh, Jagas Fontaine. So there are interventions where national government and provincial government move in to ensure that uh, service, uh, basic services are provided uh, uh, by government. We will do so, but the first thing is to support municipalities to do that work. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, we'll proceed to Honorable Tuffin. The Ngozi President, House Chair, uh, Deputy President, the large number of service delivery protests stand as a protection of the discontent amongst our people. As there currently exists exist an unequal distribution of service, particularly in rural and township areas, which are often denied critical resources. Uh, Deputy President, which measures have you put in place to ensure that there is a recruitment of skilled personnel to rural and underdeveloped developed areas to, so as to expand the provision of basic service and provide quality service even in these areas, which are often forgotten by the ANC? I thank you, Pastor. Deputy President. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. These areas have been very remembered by the ANC, uh, not forgotten. Uh, uh, one of the things that we are doing, Honorable Member, is to, uh, through the Human Resource Development Council, to ensure that there are proper skills at, at those levels, particularly the rural municipalities. In our recent uh, uh, trips to provinces, we have sought to go right deep to rural areas uh, where, as you correctly say, are challenges uh, of capacity. Uh, we have recently been to Lusikisiki uh, and looked at the uh, challenges there. Uh, we we will be going to other rural areas as well. So so it is in fact our priority uh, through the HRDC, uh, the Human Resource Development Agents. The good thing with this council, uh, not agents council, the good thing with the council is that we work with people on the ground. Uh, we work with traditional leaders. We work with farmers. Uh, we work with local business people. Um, so as a result, these communities will not be forgotten uh, because as we go down through our district development model, we exactly target those areas. Thank you very much, Honorable Mayor. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. We now pro proceed to the last supplementary question from Honorable Baden Horst. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Welcome, on the Honorable Deputy President. Deputy President, the existence of service delivery hotspots is mainly a consequence of poor governance and corruption in dysfunctional municipalities, effectively propelling local government into a cockistocracy. Um, and I can assist you if you don't know what a cockistocracy means, Deputy President. It means a state governed by its least suitable or competent citizens. Recently, Ratings Africa, a private municipal governance ratings firm, and the Auditor General reaffirmed the majority of the country's best municipalities were in fact DA-led and in the Western Cape, which is a fact. 
Will the minister inform the country whether he will be open to a national municipal best practice summit where well-run municipalities will be able to share knowledge with struggling municipalities on how to improve governance and improve service delivery? And if not, can a deputy president please provide reasons why not? Thank you, sir. Deputy President. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Honorable Badenos, uh, as I said earlier, as a governing party, we continue to monitor the performance of municipalities. That's why I said earlier, we know those are uh, functional and those that are dysfunctional because we are monitoring. But not only are we monitoring, we are intervening where we find that there are problems. Uh, currently, the, the Department of Cooperative Government and Traditional Affairs, COCTI, has identified 24 where they are already intervening. Obviously, that's the, not uh, the biggest number, uh, but they have started and the idea is to reach out to all those. We are also aware about those that are raised by the Auditor General uh, that needs attention. You are quite right that often you do find uh, problems of poor government or corruption, and those are the things that we are definitely uh, addressing, uh, even in terms of uh, people who are appointed uh, in, in, in those areas, local municipalities, we're pushing for people with competent skills, uh, people who are able to, to do the job. So the issue of who are dysfunctional municipalities is not something that uh, is left out there without attention. In fact, the biggest work of COCT at the moment, uh, directed by the presidency, is to address exactly that problem to ensure that uh, uh, we turn around municipalities because they are at the forefront of service delivery. Municipalities are the nearest to the people on the ground. Uh, and if they are dysfunctional, it means people are not getting the services they are supposed to get. Uh, so definitely, Honorable Badenos, this is, uh, this is our priority. Uh, I have participated in many summits in, in the past and uh, 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 summits uh, do help. Sometimes they are become talk shows. Uh, I think what we need to do is to ensure that there are plans for implementation. Uh, if there's a summit that comes up with good plans, good practices um, that will ensure implementation uh, we will look at that, but I think it's important that we focus on implementing plans that are going to help turn around municipalities to be able to de deliver quality services to our people. Thank you, Honorable Chairman. Yes, thank you very much, Deputy President. Honorable members, we'll now move on to question 10. This question is a question on dysfunctions at Kopanong local municipality. A uh, question has been raised by table by Honorable De Brain and is to the uh, Deputy President. Deputy President. Thank you, <clears throat> Honorable Chairperson. As I committed to this August House on the 19th of March this year, that I would undertake an oversight visit to Jackers Fontaine, I would like to report that indeed on the 9th of May, I led a government delegation comprising leaders across the three spheres of government to visit Jeffers Fontaine. The visit confirmed the challenges related to service delivery, financial sustainability, and the debt to bloom water in that municipality. This uh, Chairperson, a couple of things that we agreed on together with the Free State Government and the Harib District Municipality, as well as the private sector and other uh, stakeholders that 
we are going to, to attend to, particularly after the dam disaster of September 2022. Firstly, the immediate interventions that will include the Free State Provincial Government subsequently invoking Section 139B of the Constitution. And they've already done that on the 17th of May as part of efforts towards improving service delivery at Kopano Municipality. <clears throat> the second one, the Free State Provincial Executive Council has also appointed representatives to oversee the implementation of the, of the intervention with a focus on dealing with the water supply challenges experienced by residents and issues related to the financial viability of, viability of the municipality, as well as responding to the educational needs of youth in the area. In ensuring that we respond adequately through a sustainable solution, uh, I've asked uh, Deputy Minister Park Stau of COCTA and Deputy Minister Majola of a Department of Trade, Industry and Competition to lead a project management team that will consult with various stakeholders, such as National Treasury, Department of Water and Sanitation, in an attempt to find solutions uh, on this matter. Uh, I specifically ask this to two deputy ministers, Honorable Chairperson, because they were with me on that uh, mission. Uh, visiting that area. This project management team is working closely as we speak with the Free State Provincial uh, Department and the Department of uh, Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation uh, <clears throat> in ensuring that responses to the above challenges are anchored on ensuring that the district development model serves as a foundation for enabling adequate and efficient service delivery to the people, driving infrastructure investments and advancing local economic development. Honorable Chairperson, these are some of the citizen-centric efforts that we are providing uh, political oversight over the Kopanon local municipality. We will continue to work tirelessly towards ensuring that we deliver on our mandate and ensuring that, ensuring the improvements of life and dignity for all the people in that municipality as uh, required by the constitution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Honorable Debray. Thank you, Chairperson. And Deputy President, firstly, thank you for honoring your commitment made earlier this year by visiting Koporong local municipality. But I fear, Deputy President, much more is needed in the Kopanong local municipality. Uh, I'm sure you are aware at this, currently, or at this stage, uh, the employees and the officials of Kopanong has still not received their salaries for the month of May. And they this month, they are not, again, not going to receive their salaries. And it is expected that they will only, re only receive these two month salaries in the middle of next month. And to no surprise, all the workers and all the officials of the municipality are striking and there is currently no service delivery across or in any of the nine towns of Kopanong municipality at this stage. And adding to that, the community is still without water for 16 months now going as a result of the non-payment that you have just mentioned to uh, Bloomwater. Uh, Deputy President, uh, during your visit to Kopanong last month, uh, there were a lot of promises made by yourself, the MECs and even the Premier. But unfortunately, Deputy President, the people of Kopanonga, they are no strangers to promises made by government. Um, and they've been hearing these promises, promises for years and years on end already to no avail. And unfortunately, Deputy President, they're also used to the government making promises that, that they don't keep, especially when there's a, an election around the corner. And this has also been happening for years and years on end. So my question would be, Deputy President, um, while I appreciate the commitments that you have made um, during your visit in Koponong and here in the house today, what guarantees can you give um, that these commitments and these promises are not just empty promises as 
they have experienced in the past and has been made by our predecessor. And when can we expect to see these promises and commitments being implemented on ground level and not just on paper? Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Honorable Chairperson. Uh, Honorable Member, one of the things that we had agreed to do with the Premier of the Free State was for them to intervene. As I said in my, in my reply, um, amongst others, to particularly look at the debt to Bloom Water. Uh, the, the debt is also amongst others as a result of non-payment of, of services, not only by uh, households, uh, but also uh, by industry. Uh, so what, what, the, what Bloom Water did was then to reduce the supply of water. Uh, I'm told uh, at that time, I was told that they they only supply thirty percent of water. So, it, so you're quite right. So people don't have uh, adequate water. The Free State government was then going to intervene in in the meantime by providing uh, some resources to Bloom Water to be able to increase uh, water supply. So we'll check with them uh, where that process is. Uh, at that time, there was a talk of about 10 million rents that uh, would be made available. I, I did have a discussion with uh, Honorable uh, Pakstau, uh, who had uh, promised that uh, they are already engaging on a number of the issues affecting Kopanong, and he will give me a report in the coming week. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we will then be able to see uh, which areas still need uh, attention. Of course, if the municipality can't pay salaries, it does mean that uh, they have a challenge of resources. So we'll check with, uh, with the Free State Government on whether they were able to assist them financially. But at the end of the day, uh, it does point to the fact that the municipality uh, may not be viable and therefore uh, you may need even more intervention from provincial and national level uh, to be able to ensure that people have services and workers are paid. Uh, many local councillors or local people don't like it when government, provincial government or national government comes in to take over. Uh, but sometimes you reach a, a point where you have to do it. Uh, so we are watching Popanong carefully, uh, and other, of course, not only Kopanon, there are other municipalities uh, nearby that have similar challenges. Uh, we will support them, assist, but where we realize that uh, we're not winning, uh, provincial and national government must come in to stabilize the situation. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you, President. We'll now proceed to Honorable Mikalakis. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, Honorable Deputy President, uh, it is not only Kopanong that faces this problem. The two most serious worries that I have, uh, not disregarding uh, the challenges faced by Kopanong, is that Bloomwater is owed money also by the two biggest cities in the Free State, being Mangaung and Machabeng. Machabeng is my constituency. Now, the problem is not only due to the fact that residents and businesses aren't paying their rates and taxes. The actual problem lies with financial maladministration of these municipalities. In the nine years that I've been on the committee that deals with municipal interventions in Section 139 interventions, in these past nine years, I'm still to see an intervention of that nature that has been successful. So respectfully, I do not think that such an intervention is going to uh, bear any fruit. Now, firstly, I want to ask you, a few years ago, Deputy President, we had before the delegation from the Free State, uh, both the national and the provincial, as well as the local municipalities, these very same municipalities with the very same question. So the government knew about these problems and that the bloom water debt is going the same way as ESCOM. Why did government not act on that is the big question that we all, are all asking. 
Furthermore, I also wrote this week to the Premier a request because Belkom as the second largest city in the Free State has been without water in some cases for months in some areas, asking that there should be a financial recovery plan from the province uh, imposed on the municipality. It's a much better option than a Section 139 intervention. Would you, Deputy President, today support my request to the Premier to consider such a financial recovery plan for the Machabeng municipality? Thank you. Thank you very much, David President. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, as I said earlier, when I left uh, Kopanong, we had agreed that the two deputy ministers are going to follow up on these issues, but also the Free State Government uh, will intervene through Section 139. Uh, I have not been made aware that such interventions are not yielding fruit, uh, but as I said, uh, I'm getting a report next week from Honorable Pak Stau to uh, check what the problem is. Uh, and of course, uh, you're quite right that the challenge is not only uh, Kopano. Uh, we'll have to look at what's happening in Machabing and uh, as you are saying also, uh, there may be a problem elsewhere in, in the province. So my spirit is that oh, Bloom, Bloom what is not only uh, Kopano. And we need to, to look at all of them so that we don't resolve Kopanong and then tomorrow there's Machabing uh, or another municipality. We are going to look holistically at all of them. Uh, so I, I will get a report from uh, the deputy ministers, uh, particularly the deputy minister of Cocta next week. We will look at sustainable solutions. Uh, and if there are solutions that will help us, if uh, Section 139 is not assisting, we'll look at what else we should do there uh, to be able to, to resolve that situation. And there uh, we will report uh, once more back to this August House. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Deputy Chair. Deputy President, sorry. We'll proceed to Honorable Muletan. Thank you, Chairperson. Deputy President, the people of Kopano, they actually want to hear what kind of a help will be provided to their municipality to recover from its financial challenges, which it is currently uh, facing. In particular, the low revenue, in, uh, revenue collection and large debt to service providers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. Indeed, when we were there, we had an opportunity to meet with all stakeholders, including business. Uh, and of course, all of them were keen uh, that they want to see their municipalities being able uh, to service them. We committed that we're going to uh, assist the municipality because the provincial government was there. The premier was there himself with all the MECs to be able to assist the municipality. And that's why they intervened with section 139, but also they were going to assist the municipality to provide some finance to be able to pay Bloom Water to be able to, to provide uh, uh, water in the area. We look at what other further measures we need to put in place to be able to assist the people of that area. Uh, obviously, when I get a report next week from Deputy Minister Parkstar, we'll see whether there are other measures that we need to put in place to, to intervene beyond Section 139. But for me, what is urgent is to ensure that we can stabilize the issue of water supply in the area. We must ensure that there is a proper provision of services, including uh, the removal of uh, 
of waste uh, in the townships uh, to ensure there's proper waste management uh, and also to ensure there are proper services to business communities. In fact, when we were there, there were business people who wanted to invest in the area. In fact, they were not just looking at uh, Kopano, but they were looking at the broader Harib district. And they were saying, we want to invest here. If you can get the municipalities to operate correctly, we are coming in because most of them don't have proper revenue because you don't have industries and so on. So I was very happy that business was there. Was they, as you help to fix this place, we are coming in. And that's going to help those municipalities to survive because they will then have a proper uh, revenue base. Uh, but we are focusing on that and we are going to make sure that we fix the problem. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Honorable Nkosi. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. Greetings to the Honorable Deputy President. The challenges that are facing Blue Water are also as a result of aging infrastructure that continues to hamper the future water demand targets as stated in the Greater Bloemfontein Reconciliation Strategy. The mayor of Machabeng, Councillor Kalipa, which has been without water for days, has indicated that Machabeng alone needs half a billion rent for water infrastructure to deal with the current water shading pro problems. Honorable Deputy President, what measures are in place to ensure that more resources to ensure that Bloom Water and many of the water boards that are facing similar challenges throughout the country have access to more funding for service, delivery, infrastructure, restoration, and maintenance. Thank you. Deputy President. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Chairperson. Thank you very much, Honorable Nkos. Uh, we are working very closely with the Minister of, of Water and, and, and Sanitation on these matters. And one of the things the minister is committed to do is to address this problem of aging infrastructure. Uh, it's not only in the free state area. We've uh, noticed that there are a number of areas in the country where you have aging infrastructure. And, and the Minister of Water and Sanitation has been doing that audit throughout uh, to pick up where these problems are, to be able to intervene to ensure that we can then uh, put in new infrastructure in many of these areas. Uh, so that work is a work that is already underway. Uh, so we will definitely not forget the free state, uh, Machabeng, as you said, they, they don't have the money to do it themselves, uh, half a billion, as you said. Uh, but the Minister of Water Affairs and Sanitation is already aware of this. They've already picked it up and they are look, looking at, uh, at the solution uh, and, and to ensure that we can assist uh, these municipalities to renew uh, this infrastructure so that they can provide better services and be able to get revenue uh, from taxpayers, the households, and also businesses in their areas. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank, thank you very much, Deputy President. Honorable members, uh, we will now proceed to question number 11. And this is a question on eradication of fraud and or corruption and or theft in the department. Uh, this question is from Honorable Professor and is directed to Deputy President. Deputy President. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Chairperson, the land reform program remains a major part of the work of government. We must not waver on this task if we are to realize our transformation agenda. We must not allow anyone or anything to defocus us on this task. Worst of all, the allegations 
of fraud and corruption. It is for this reason that Cabinet approved the National Anti-Corruption Strategy in November 2020, which enables the county to step up the fight against fraud and corruption. As part of investigating allegations of corruption, we are working with various law enforcement agencies and entities to ensure that those responsible for such activities are prosecuted and to put in place corrective measures to mitigate against the recurrence of such acts. In this regard, President Cyril Ramaphosa signed Proclamation R114 of 2023, authorizing the Special Investigating Unit, SIU, to investigate allegations of maladministration and corruption in the former National Department of Agriculture, Forest and Fisheries projects called Ili Malitzema Support Program, and to recover any financial losses suffered by the state. According to the Special Investigation Unit, the proclamation covers offenses which took place between the inception of Litzema and 17, and 17 February 2023, or after the date of publication of the proclamation. But it's relevant to connect with incidental or ancillary to the matters mentioned in the schedule or involve the same persons, entities, or contracts investigated. One of the cases that are under investigation by the SIU relates to the concluding of a lease agreement with Cultiva Investments, which the Special Tribunal has recently declared as being irregular or unlawful. This is one of this is one amongst many matters that the department has taken steps to investigate after the emergence of fraud and corruption allegations. Internal investigations have resulted in disciplinary hearings, civil and criminal referrals of employees who are implicated in acts of corruption. As the chairperson of the Interministerial Committee on Land Reform, we will continue to work with implementing departments and entities in fast-tracking land reform and the coordination of programs to accelerate land reform and agricultural support, and will ensure that we root out corruption and fraud in that sector. Thank you very much, Chairs. Thank you very much, David President. We'll proceed to Honorable Professor. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Honorable Deputy President, thank you for uh, very briefly um, um, explaining to us the, the processes and procedures that you are going to follow. I just want to ask you further than that, um, in terms of the backlog of land reform um, and the, the problems that, or the challenges that we have with the eradication of alleged fraud corruption and theft in the department. Why is there in the system nothing built in like, in terms of the act on, on um, fraud and uh, uh, the act of the prevention on fraud and corrupt activities? Where, what happened to checks and balances and consequences? Because what I referred you to is a case way back of 2019, and it's now 2023, and nothing has happened so far. Thank you. Deputy President. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Member. I uh, take note of the fact that uh, uh, the issue you raised uh, could have been ad addressed uh, uh, long ago or previously. But in our <coughs> discussion with, with the department, they did indicate that uh, they are following the guide to implement lifestyle audits as well as part of the anti-fraud uh, campaign in the department. Uh, so we are going to be engaging with them to look at what more can be done. Uh, you know, uh, you'll recall that the anti-fraud uh, framework 
is a framework that covers the whole of government. And we want all the departments to be able to do that, but come up with uh, additional measures. So the lifestyle or what they call the, the lifestyle audits in the public service is now one of the things that is being used to ensure that uh, it helps us to uh, cap uh, corruption in, in the departments. Uh, we will engage with the department to see if uh, more can be done if things don't improve quicker. Uh, but otherwise, uh, it's a matter that they are attended to. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you, Deputy President. We'll proceed to Honorable Mkiva. Uh, Chairperson, good afternoon to you and good afternoon to the Deputy President as well as the members of this August House. Um, Deputy President, Section 3 of the Public Service Act of 1994 allows the Minister for the Public Service and Administration to establish norms and standards relating to integrity, ethics, conduct and anti-corruption in the public service, which includes the adoption of the lifestyle, as you have alluded to, lifestyle audits, as a legitimate fraud prevention and detection mechanism. This is just by way of emphasizing the issue because I know that you have already covered this very well. But the point where I want you to help us is the fact that one of one would have expected that by now all national provincial departments and other entities of state would have long employed this mechanism uh, to ensure that it is in full swing. What is the reason that the government has not fully implemented these lifestyle audits as a measure to combat corruption uh, to this point? Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> uh, Honorable um, Kiva. I agree with you that uh, uh, we should move faster to get all government departments to implement uh, this mechanism. We all agree that fraud and corruption in our country, particularly in the public sector, seriously undermine the efforts of government uh, to deliver. And that's why government came up with this guide to implement uh, lifestyle audits. But as you say, uh, not all government departments have moved with speed and therefore uh, it is up to the presidency to ensure that we check all the departments and ensure that all of them uh, introduce uh, and implement these guidelines uh, to be able to uh, cap fraud and corruption. Uh, even the guidelines on, on uh, lifetime audits needs to be regular, rigorously implemented to ensure that uh, uh, we're able to uh, cap the problem. You may be aware that the president has established what we call the National Anti-Corruption Advisory Council, which will advise government on the implementation of a society-wide response against corruption. This council will in the main focus on legislative reforms, monetary and evaluation of procurements where a lot of corruption does take place. So it will help us a lot uh, once uh, uh, these mechanisms uh, are put in place uh, faster. Uh, but we agree with you that uh, there's, there's a need to ensure that all government departments do implement these measures. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President. Uh, we'll now move on to all of our debate. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Deputy President. The IFP has long held the view that uh, government's commitment to land reform and coordination of an acceleration of government's program towards agricultural support is not convincing. Though budget allocation may sometimes match the need, but it does not match the action and progress on the ground. This, of course, may be attributed to activities of theft, fraud, and corruption. I would like to know whether the government has any plan or plans of recouping monies embezzled 
through litigation of those officials found guilty of such and what time frame can be given for that? Thank you. The president. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, <clears throat> as I indicated earlier, the, the SIU does recoup uh, monies once people are prosecuted uh, and be able to return the funds to the fiscals. Uh, so we'll do that with all the program where we find that uh, fraud and corruption is committed. Uh, I'm not able to give a, a, a definite uh, time frame at the moment on how we will be able to, to complete the process of looking at uh, this particular aspect, but uh, obviously it's a matter that requires urgent attention. I'm sure Honorable Khadeb will understand that uh, uh, we also accept that it needs urgent attention. We will look at the time frames later, but obviously I take your point that uh, where we are intervening, we should do it quicker. Uh, so we will do exactly that, uh, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Honorable Lehi. Mukhatla yo gusang o paletsu mo na kunye fitile. Bitla di polo tse di tsepame. Khatlano le bobodu le tsinwe ya bogodu. Se o di bonwa mo ke tapeleng ya le kokole le busang mo bo ga di kantoro le bo ma di kantoro ba shebile go utswa go ikhumisa go khona le gore ba digele le go thusa ba o ba ba qhlopile. Ka ga mo ke tsereganyo e feng ya potlako e tla sewa Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, person. Uh, honorable member, the, there are various activities that government uh, is uh, implementing to deal with fraud and corruption. Uh, uh, SIU, Special Investigation Unit, it's our it's a Nehabona Huna Lebu Hood, a Bakeba Libellet, a Tabayo, me hung at a Batuba Tsuarwa, a Habatsuere, a Releza Hore, a Obele Le Punishment, Yabatuba Tsuarwa, Scaba Fellow or Batuba Tsuere, our Nantuezala, Fellahe. Lady Chalette is a muso to one twenty de boy. Eh, about to one killer chalette and muso cabu hodu. A twenty boy chalette. Eh, retreats our SIUNA. A sabelet se secha. Our chalette hunt and take ya secha. Renali mus or le mus or a sabeta. A sabedis a chalette and a re sabeleta. Receivables are such a big challenge as such. Kamo kia utwa na lwe na or kahu na lubo kodo muso tsanzo uetsenele tabayo uetsalor di challenge za muso di buwe batu ba ba nande ba ling mo di programu se tabu kodo ba utla iwe in other words. The people who are involved in fraud and corruptions uh, must be arrested and they must be prosecuted and punished and the resources of the people must be returned to the government. And we think that the SIU is doing a good job uh, in executing that mandate. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President, honorable members. We now move on to the last question. And this is question number 12. 
and the question is on delivery of essential services. Question is from Warren Abrahai, uh, directed to the Deputy President. Uh, Deputy President. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. The government is focusing on strengthening leadership and professionalization of the public service, skills development, accountability, interdepartmental coordination, intergovernmental relations, and better governance and state of state-owned enterprises. On the 19th of October last year, cabinet approved the national framework towards the professionalization of the public sector. The framework was introduced to ensure that only qualified and competent individuals are appointed into positions of authority in pursuit of a transformed, professional, ethical, capable, and developmental public sector. The professionalization framework has been extended to the national, provincial, and local spheres of government, organs of state, and also the legislative sector. Therefore, recommendations made in the national framework shall be consistently applied across the public sector, including in the military, state security, police, and correctional services. Honorable Chairperson, our state-owned enterprises are at the forefront of economic and social transformation in our country. SOEs are key drivers for the provision of critical infrastructure required for the development of our country's economy. This includes electrical generation, com commuter transport, water provision, freight logistics, technology, telecommunications, amongst others. In order to closely monitor the performance of state-owned enterprises, the Department of Planning, Monitoring, Evaluation launched the State-Owned Enterprises Monitoring Framework in March this year to strengthen the oversight capacity of departments to oversee public entities. These are some of the measures that government has implemented to maximize the capacity and capability of government departments and state entities to ensure greater alignment across the public sector to optimize interconnection between planning and performance management. The president has delegated to us to monitor the implementation of the district development model, which is an operational model for improving cooperative governance aimed at building a capable ethical and developmental state. The DDM embodies an approach by which the three spheres of government and state entities work in unison in an impact-oriented way and where there is higher performance and accountability of coherent service delivery and development outcomes. Through outreach programs and oversight visits that we are currently conducting, we are able to troubleshoot challenges at district levels to ensure one plans, uh, that one plans are developed and implemented to address service delivery challenges at that level. To further maximize the capacity and capabilities of government departments and entities, the government has forged partnership with science councils, namely the Human Science Research Council, Council for Geoscience and many others, to establish a community of practice of science council monitoring and evaluation practitioners. The purpose of the community of practice is to share lessons learned to best practices among the members to build the planning, monitoring, evaluation capacity and capabilities of government departments and state entities. In this regard, the Human Resource Research Council is working with government to support local government initiative to improve service delivery. Chairperson government will continue to build state capacity and capabilities by encouraging continuous learning and professional development through institutions like the National School of Government and Tibet Colleges and Science Council and institutions of higher learning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Khai. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson, and greetings uh, to the Honorable Deputy President. I was worried as uh, the Deputy President was continuing uh, that uh, he would even cover my follow-up question, and he has already done so. <laughs> uh, but uh, nevertheless, I will ask uh, the, the question, uh, 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 how, the, how is the government leveraging uh, on the country science council to maximize the capacity and capabilities of state-owned enterprises and the local government sphere. As I said, yeah, yes, uh, even uh, touched on the number of uh, science councils uh, that are there in the country. Yeah, Thank David you so So I, I thought Honorable Rai will say that uh, I'm covered. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, but just to say, uh, Honorable Chairperson, that uh, there is a lot that has been done that I can cover just during this uh, question, particularly through the district development model. Uh, there are a lot of initiatives. Uh, we are engaging lead departments, amongst others, on data observatory to enable real-time access to DTM information, deploying municipal innovation maturity index, harnessing solutions developed by departments of science and innovation, and submit DDM project information to the department of COCTA. So there is a lot that uh, we, we are doing to ensure that uh, uh, state entities are able to, to do their work uh, properly, but also to support government interventions. And a lot of work that we, we are doing at, at the level of government, uh, support comes amongst others from the science councils, uh, as we've seen even during the, uh, the, the period of COVID-19, we were able to develop interventions because of uh, our science councils. So they are very important and they are helping us a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, we'll then proceed to Honorable Magwala. Protect me, Chair. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson of the NCOP, and greetings to the Deputy President, uh, to the members of the House. Uh, Deputy President, I'm not covered at all. <laughs> Whether the measures that you are referring to and also include making commitments for all spheres of government to directly provide services in these areas which are functions of the state. If so, which in initiatives have you taken to, to insource all the workers working in government departments and facilities in which and which time frames have you put in place in these regards? And also, Deputy President, why is the ANC so against the insourcement of our people in these departments? Do you know that, Deputy President, that if a security guard that is outsourced is costing 14,000 rand for its services from a private sector, but the security guard is earning 4,000 rand, 500 rand, I think the survey has been done also in the insourcement of the security guards in Gauteng uh, municipalities that the EFF has pushed there. Why is the government of the ANC so desperately to, to do tenders and not do away with tenders and insource our people and put them and give them the necessary benefits that they deserve so that we move away from outsourcing even a mere thing of a water bottle that must be insourced, but we can insource our own people that can go and buy these waters, not private companies. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Deputy yeah, President. Uh, if 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 I knew that you will ask, if I suspected that you'll ask that question, I would have gotten some figures uh, to ensure that. Uh, you become aware that uh, government is one of the biggest employers in the country, as we speak, the biggest. 
it is already <laughs> it is already the biggest uh, the ANC uh, honorable member uh, is not obsessed with outsourcing uh, in many of the institutions we run in government whether at provincial local level even national we do employ people uh, there are a, a maybe particular times when you need particular skills from from industry that you you would then go and tender to bring in a particular company it is done everywhere in the world you'll there, there'll never be a time when you have all the skills in government uh, that you require and, and all the expertise and when you don't you then go out to then get those skills uh, but it's not our preoccupation to outsource uh, uh, we we believe in insourcing you will see it happening all the time thank you very much Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy President. To proceed to Honorable Detroit. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Honorable uh, Deputy President, thank you for the answer. The initial question speaks to the delivery of essential services. It also speaks to weakening state capacity. Mm -hmm. And in your previous answers on this question, you mentioned the, the uh, professionalization of the public sector. But, Honorable Deputy President, in the Auditor General reports, that we've been receiving for the, for the past few years now. It's evident that political interference is one of the major issues that contributes to failing municipalities. Uh, in a previous answer, you mentioned that the amount of dysfunctional municipalities has increased. A few weeks back, the Minister of Electricity was here and he said that a uh, possibility of a blackout is not off the table. It will not be, according to him, on the generation side, but on the distribution side. Now, when I go back to the beginning with the delivery of essential services, which is water, amongst others, we're currently struggling to get some of the water reticulation plants excluded from um, uh, uh, being victim of load shedding. And that is happening. Yes, some generators are being put in place. But that's not something that can be pulled through until end of days. So, Deputy President, I want to know, does government have a backup plan to ensure that the country and municipal municipalities do have sufficient water supply in the event of a grid collapse? And is there an estimated calculation for how long essential services like water supply will be available in these municipal areas as uh, um, with the current storage facilities that they do have. Thank you, Deputy President. Um, yes, Deputy President. Well, let, let me start the way you started. Uh, <laughs> you said there's political interference. Uh, now, many people uh, sometimes fail to understand that uh, politicians do have a role in in government, whether it's at local level, provincial, and it's provided for in the constitution and legislation. And I'll give you one example. Uh, if you are an MEC in a province, you are what is called the executing authority. It means you have the power to execute, and in fact, you are the final arbiter, not the DG. But often people, when politicians do their work, they say it's interference, because we don't read the legislation properly. Yes, the, the legislation does give HODs and DGs their, their, their authority, their powers, but it does give politicians as well. So often is how do you relate to one another in that space? Uh, the MEC must not, uh, you know, uh, stand on the, on the toes of, of the HOD or the minister, the DG, and vice versa, but they all have roles. So what we need to do to avoid political interference, so-called, everybody must understand their roles. This is my role, and here. 
DG, this is your role up to there. And once we all understand our roles, you will never have a problem. Uh, now, let me go back to water. Uh, in fact, I was uh, addressing a meeting this morning, and one of the things I said is that we are in discussion uh, with them, with with our ministers, to ensure that we don't get to a water crisis, uh, because we we don't want to deal with issues because there's a crisis. Uh, there shouldn't be a water crisis. Uh, secondly, I think we must disabuse ourselves from this comment of great failure. It's, it's, it's not helpful. It is, it's almost like a scarecrow. Uh, there will be no great failure. No, there shouldn't be. Uh, because you know, you know what grid failure is. Uh, you, you say we must not say these things lightly because, I mean, a, a grid failure it means so in, in, means we're going to the dark. It, it, there's no electricity. There, there's nothing. What? Yeah, you know. Uh, let let me conclude because they, maybe this is a debate for another day. You know, the, the Minister of Electricity said something very interesting uh, when I saw him two days ago. And he says to me, you know, uh, when there's a problem of load shedding, uh, I get uh, a lot of questions uh, about what has gone wrong, this and this. He says, but when I improve, nobody appreciates. He says it's, it's almost like the improvement is through prayer. Uh, nobody says, oh, Minister of Electricity, we can see now the lights are on. What have you done? What are you doing? He says, no, they don't ask me that. Uh, no, no, it's, 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 it's beyond burning diesel. If you, look, if you listen to him yesterday, uh, those who saw him, he said, I'm doing this deal with Mozambique because one of the things I want to do is to avoid to continue to ban diesel. He said that. Uh, but when things are good, the uh, honorable chairperson, you don't get any praise. When they are bad, yo, 101 questions will come to you. So, so honorable member, yes, we are going to come with a very strong strategy that we always have water. Uh, South Africa has got a lot of dams. We must just make sure that there's access. Because sometimes it's not that there's no water. Just that the reticulation is a problem. People don't access water. We must show, make sure that they, in fact, access water and that uh, uh, there shall be no grid collapse. Yeah, we are fixing the power stations, even the old ones. The ones that uh, some of you were saying we must abandon. Oh, no, we're going to fix them uh, so that we don't transition in the dark. Yeah. Thank you very much, Deputy President. We proceed to Honorable Christian. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. Honorable Deputy President, I'm going to take you back to. Um, political interference, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Honorable Deputy President, you should have a bird's eye view of the effectiveness in governments across South Africa. Now, without a shadow of a doubt, the median DA-run government delivers better services than the median ANC-run government. It's true. It cannot be denied. We do not argue, of course, that there are exceptions to both. But on the whole, the ANC is delivering the worst services to the citizens of South Africa, where you as the ANC govern. The practice of deploying incompetent cadres has a direct impact on the capacity of municipalities because of office bearers that are handpicked based on their political loyalty instead of their fitness for the job. Whereas the DA employs competent people to run their governments, and it is reflected in most metrics. 
The ANC, through the Deployment Committee in the Tulu House, has eroded the capacity of most governments to deliver to the most vulnerable. Now, Deputy President, when will you stop this practice of sending incompetent people to key positions that directly wow. impact the most vulnerable and ensure that people who are fit for purpose are employed through a fair and transparent process? Thank you, Chairperson. Deputy President, thank you very much. Uh, uh, on <laughs> you are eating on my time. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, uh, okay, let me leave the, the issue of uh, political interference because you didn't make any point. You, you threatened to make a point. I didn't hear it. Uh, the second one of incompetent, it's not true. Uh, in fact, let me give you an example. All the mayors of the ANC currently, all of them, starting from metros right down, uh, have been interviewed before they assumed office. No, no, they were interviewed by the most competent people there to produce their qualifications. So it's, it's just that sometimes uh, the DA doesn't understand the issue of CADA development because they think that, uh, uh, listen, they think that uh, when you talk about CADA development and deployment, you just go fetch someone in the streets and say, go there. No. Uh, there's even a school in the ANC. People are trained. Uh, Yes, we train people, we check them, we, we make sure that when they are deployed, they are interviewed and the most competent gets appointed. Um, so this story about we, you know, appointing incompetent people is not true. In government, um, when I was a, a minister in government, before you appoint a DG, because I know we have been accused that we just pick up uh, DGs that we like. No. When I was in, in national government at the time as a minister, if you want to have a DG, you must advertise. You must make sure there's a proper short listing. And when the DG is interviewed, the minister sits with three other ministers and deputy ministers and other DGs to, to interview. Uh, so it's, it's not like them, any minister come and say, no, uh, now I want Mahomet Dango. Uh, no, you go through a proper rigorous process of interviews. Uh, so, so in short, Chairperson, I want to say to Honorable Chris, uh, Christy, I dismiss your assertion. <laughs> thank you very much, Shona. No, no, thank you very much. Uh, yes. As the deputy president takes his seat, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to, to thank him uh, for availing himself for this particular sitting. Uh, an appreciation also goes to permanent delegates, special delegates, and uh, all MECs, uh, especially those who are on virtual. Uh, honorable mem members and, and delegates, uh, that, that, And but the forms of the
Recording stopped.